everybody? Yes, go ahead. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the City Council Chambers. I am Council Member Vanessa Gibson of the 16th District in the Bronx, and I am proud to serve as Chair of the Committee on Public Safety. I want to thank all of my colleagues for joining us today. Uh, we're going to begin the hearing of the Committee on Public Safety with a vote before we we continue with a joint hearing of the Committee on Public Safety and Oversight and Investigation. This afternoon, the Committee on Public Safety will be voting on proposed intro 1267A, sponsored by Councilmember Rory Lansman, which relates to prohibiting certain disclosures of intimate images. The non-consensual disclosure of sexually explicit images or videos, commonly referred to as revenge porn, is a new phenomenon where intimate photos that are taken consensually, usually in the context of an intimate relationship are then shared non-consensually, often for the purpose of blackmail, coercion, or to punish victims. Unfortunately, over the past 10 years, this has become a national issue. One in 25 internet users, mostly between the ages of 18 and 29 years old, have been a victim. The sharing of intimate content without one's consent is a traumatic experience for many victims, which can lead to an array of mental health effects, as well as depression and suicide, as well as the loss of employment. We know that many victims undergo an uphill battle to rebuild their lives, to become a survivor, preserve their integrity and dignity after this experience. And it's important that the city of New York recognizes this criminal act and has a process in place by which victims can receive justice. This intro 1267, sponsored by Councilmember Lansman, will address this behavior. This bill will criminalize the non-consensual disclosure of sexually explicit images, making this act a misdemeanor punishable by up to one year in jail and or a $1,000 fine, as well as allowing for a civil cause of action. I want to thank Councilmember Lansman for sponsoring this legislation and certainly all the advocates that testified at our hearing on this very important topic. In addition, I want to thank the Public Safety Committee and the staff for working on this important bill. We continue as a city to strive to pass legislation that truly keeps every New Yorker safe. I hope my colleagues join me in favor of voting in the affirmative on proposed intro 1267A. And I want to acknowledge the members of the Public Safety Committee who are here with us this afternoon. Councilmember Rory Lansman, Councilmember Jamani Williams, Councilmember Vincent Gentili, Councilmember Jimmy Vaca, and Minority Leader Steve Matteo. Do any of my colleagues have any questions as it relates to the bill before the committee today? Okay, and now we will ask our committee clerk to call the roll and begin the vote. And once again, thank you colleagues for your presence here today. Thank you. Committee Clerk Matthew DeStefano, Committee on Public Safety. Roll call vote on intro 1267A. Chair Gibson. I vote aye. Gentile. I vote aye. Vaca. I vote aye. Williams. Excuse me, my vote. Yes. Thank you. I just want to thank Councilmember Lansman and the chair uh, for this bill. It's very important. I think I went to a press conference maybe a year or two on this bill to speak on this. Uh, I was actually shocked that this wasn't illegal to begin with. And I just want to say what I said then. I believed, uh, unfortunately, it's primarily uh, women that deal with this. And if it was a man's issue, uh, so-called, I'm pretty sure it would have been illegal by now. So uh, I'm just proud that we're uh, correcting something that needs to be corrected. Congratulations to Councilman Lansman. With that, I vote aye. Lansman. Aye. Matteo. Aye. By vote of six in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and no abstentions, the item has been adopted. All right. Thank you once again, colleagues. We're going to keep the roll open for the Committee on Public Safety as it relates to intro 1267, and we will begin the joint hearing of the Committee on Oversight and Investigation and Public Safety. And now I turn this over to my colleague, Chair Gentili. Thank you once again, colleagues. Thank you, uh, Chair Gibson, and good evening, or good afternoon, I should say, to everyone. Uh, I am Council Member Vincent uh, Gentili, Chair of the Oversight and Investigations Committee. 
Joining me here are other members of the committee uh, from Manhattan, Councilmember Bill Perkins, and uh, two members from Queens, Councilmember Danny Drum and Councilmember Rory Lansman, and I'm sure we'll have other members joining us as the afternoon goes on. Um, I also want to uh, thank Chair Vanessa Gibson of the Public Safety Committee and the members of the Public Safety Committee uh, for being here today. I would like to uh, uh, particularly thank Chair Gibson for jointly scheduling this oversight hearing with us to examine the Office of the Inspector General of the Police Department, also referred to in short as the PDIG. Following longstanding concerns about the NYPD's use of stop and frisk and other police policies and procedures, the City Council passed the bill and then overrode Mayor Bloomberg's veto to create an Inspector General for the Police Department. The bill was structured in a way so the Department of Investigation could use its broad charter mandated jurisdiction and apply it as an institutional focus on the Police Department. In this more expansive role, DOI, according to the New York City Charter, Section 803B, may, quote, make any study or investigation which, in the Commissioner's opinion, may be in the best interest of the city, close quote. In his veto message, Mayor Bloomberg reasoned that this bill overreaches DOI's original function, spreads city resources too thin, and harms the city's ability to protect New Yorkers from terrorism. With some passage of time and perspective on the creation of PDIG, this hearing will in part evaluate that estimation by the former mayor. After more than three years in effect, the, committee, the committees and the council would like to better understand the operations and processes of the Office of Inspector General. Evaluating the success or shortfalls of such a complex entity is challenging. However, analyzing the office's function in accordance with the intent is more feasible. According to the enabling legislation, the first goal of the PDIG is to enhance the effectiveness of the police department. Of course, this goal is not unique only to the PDIG, as many advocacy organizations, policymakers, members of the public, and even internally the NYPD themselves aspire to take steps to improve policing in New York City. However, what is unique about the Office of the Inspector General is that they are able to obtain an inside look of the procedures of the police department and they issue policy recommendations to the NYPD based on their investigations. Moreover, under this legislation, now law, the police department is legally required to respond to the Inspector General's recommendations within 90 days. Finally, the IG then qualifies and places the NYPD's response to these policy recommendations under the following categories. Recommendations that were rejected, implemented, partially implemented, accepted in principle, partially accepted in principle, or under consideration by the NYPD. The second stated task of the Inspector General is to increase public safety. Statistics do show that crime in New York City has indeed decreased since the inception of the PDIG. Yet the question we pose does not lie in the crime statistics themselves, but in the IG's contribution to the decrease of crime across New York City. The third task of the Office Inspector General is to protect civil liberties and civil rights of New Yorkers. Once again, there are many entities that already share the same mission the Civilian Complaint Review Board, the Commission to Combat Police Corruption, the Police Department's own Internal Affairs Bureau, local and federal prosecutors, and even the City Council. However, the Office of Inspector General is not designated to replicate the CCRB or any other entity that protects civil liberties. Instead, they independently focused on the systemic and institutional component of protecting civil liberties and civil rights. Finally, the fourth task of the Inspector General is to increase the public's confidence in the police force. Other police inspector generals across the country have found measured success in this regard. For example, the City of Los Angeles had an independent monitor to oversee the Los Angeles Police Department from 2001 to 2009. A study undertaken by the Harvard Kennedy School of Government showed that public satisfaction with the LAPD increased in the eight years the decree was in effect. While there has been no similar measurement in New York's effort, and while the NYPD Inspector General has had about half the time to see results, we will still explore the PDIG's role in increasing the public's confidence 
in the police force. To answer our questions and provide more insight, we have the Department Investigation Commissioner Mark Peters and NYPD Inspector General Phil Urey testifying here today. We thank you both for appearing and in participating, and we look forward to hearing more about your work. We also uh, thank the advocacy organizations and members of the public. They may actually, may actually testify before the council later on today. And with that, I'd like to uh, ask Chair Gibson uh, to make her opening statement. Thank you very much, Chair Gentili. Good afternoon once again. Um, I'm proud to join with my colleague in chairing today's hearing. I want to thank him for the opportunity. Um, as he mentioned, we're examining the officer of the Inspector General for the NYPD, and we truly know that the safety of every New Yorker in every neighborhood is of paramount importance to each and every one of us, and we depend on the hardworking men and women of the NYPD to protect us each and every day. The vast majority of times, the NYPD serves our communities with honor, integrity, respect, and bravery, and we as a community expect them to do that each and every day. Unfortunately, we know there are times when the department does not comply with the standards and expectations of the public of our city. In 2013, this city council passed Local Law 70, which was chaptered into law, which empowered the Department of Investigations to conduct independent oversight of the NYPD. The DOI has been given the responsibility of reviewing, investigating, studying, and auditing and making specific recommendations relating to the operations, policies, and practices and procedures of the department. To date, the NYPD IG's office has published 12 reports ranging on issues from the NYPD's approach of handling interactions with people in mental and emotional crisis to an assessment of the department's body-worn camera policy. We in the city of New York are fortunate in that not only do we have our five district attorneys, internal NYPD IAB, the CCRB, but we also have the NYPD IG, all of these acronyms, to independently review the department and hold them accountable. It is essential that we truly strike a very delicate but important balance between public safety and the preservation of the rights of our residents in this city. The NYPD IG plays a crucial role in this process through its review and investigation of department policies and procedures. This afternoon during our hearing, I certainly want to hear more about how the NYPD IG selects the issues and topics, um, as well as recommendations of policies and procedures for the department to continue to improve its work. Certainly the interaction that the NYPD has with other oversight agencies such as the CCRB as well as the Internal Affairs Bureau and how the office holds the department accountable. The NYPD IG plays a very important role in the fabric of our city, ensures the public safety of all residents, and I truly look forward to this afternoon's testimony. I want to thank you, Commissioner, and thank you for being here to both of you, and I want to thank the Committee on Public Safety for all of their work, uh, my senior legislative council Council, Deepa Ambakar and Brian Crow, our legislative council, Beth Golub, our legislative policy analyst, Casey Addison, and our senior financial analyst, Steve Reister, my chief of staff, Dana Wax. I thank you for your work in getting today's hearing together. I also want to recognize we've been joined by Council Member Robert Cornegie and Council Member Costa Constantinides. And before we begin with the testimony, I want to get back to the vote very quickly. Thank you so much for your indulgence. Committee on Public Safety, continuation of roll call on intro 1267A, Council Member Cornegie. Vote aye. Okay. Okay, thank you so much, and now I'll turn it back over to Chair Gentili, and welcome once again. I'll ask our, our uh, committee council to please swear in uh, the witnesses. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. I do. I do. You may begin your testimony. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Gibson, members of the Committee on Public Safety, and Chair Gentili and members of the Committee on Oversight and Investigation. I'm Mark Peters, Commissioner of the New York City Department of Investigation. 
Thank you for this opportunity to address the committees and provide an update on the work of DOI's Inspector General for the NYPD over the past four years and highlight many of its successes. It's fitting that DOI provide its first comprehensive public briefing on the work and impact of its police inspector general before this committee, the driving force that pushed to pass Local Law 70 in 2013 and mandated independent oversight of the New York City Police Department for the first time. Local Law 70 required that as commissioner of DOI, I appoint an inspector general to, quote, investigate, review, study, audit, and make recommendations relating to the operations, policies, programs, and practices of the NYPD, close quote. Our mission, consistent with guiding principles of the law, as well as our overarching mandate under the Charter to serve as Inspector General for all city agencies, is to, quote, enhance the effectiveness of the police department, increase public safety, protect civil liberties and civil rights, and increase the public's confidence in the police force, thereby building stronger police community relations. I'm joined here today by Philip Yor, who I appointed in 2014 as DOI's Inspector General for the NYPD, who has been leading our charge in these efforts. I commend the Council's foresight and collective wisdom with which you crafted Local Law 70, ensuring that the Inspector General's office was situated within the DOI framework, which has been instrumental in conducting our oversight of the NYPD. In particular, the statutory powers that imbue DOI with independence give us authority to issue subpoenas and have complete, unfettered access to all government documents, workers, and information, to arrest those who we believe have committed crimes, to see across all government agencies, and to insist upon systemic changes to improve the way the city runs. These powers have ensured that we are able to carry out our investigations of the policies and practices of the NYPD, which is an unprecedented feat that would have been nearly impossible outside of DOI. For example, our investigation of the NYPD's compliance with court-mandated rules known as the Handshoe Guidelines, which govern the investigation of religious and political groups and activity, would have been hindered significantly if the police inspector general did not have the powers that DOI, as a law enforcement agency, provides its inspector generals to access and review sensitive and highly confidential intelligence documents that are only available to law enforcement. Further, the creation of any new inspector general's office is a challenge from hiring talented staff with a broad range of investigative skills, to setting protocols for production of documents and information, and ensuring cooperation with those protocols, to crafting procedures for the conduct, scope, and subjects of investigations. Establishing and enforcing these protocols and procedures with an institution as large as the NYPD would be impossible without the counterbalancing institutional power and weight of the Department of Investigation. In accordance with Local Law 70, the Inspector General publishes written, publicly available reports for any investigation, review, study, or audit it completes. The NYPD Police Commissioner is required to submit a written response to each published report within 90 days, which are made publicly available and can be accessed on the DOI website. In its first four years, the Inspector General has been able to build an impressive collection of critical analyses of policing in the city. These include assessment of NYPD's handling of U visa certifications by immigrants to ensure that we all, as a city, are doing everything we can to push back against horrific national policies. Review of NYPD's use of force in New York City, which resulted in the department's first ever agreement to track force and assess and an end an assessment of the NYPD's body-worn cameras pilot program, which focuses on a review of activation, policy compliance, access to footage, and retention. This deep dive analysis of a range of critical policing issues has resulted in recommendations, many of which have been accepted by the NYPD and which will further protect the rights of New Yorkers, all while improving NYPD's accountability and efficiency. Inspector General Yor will provide a more detailed update on the work of his team momentarily. 
Going forward, in addition to new investigations, DOI will also consistently monitor the adoption and implementation by the NYPD of our recommendations for operational reform and preventive measures as it relates to their policies and practices. This monitoring is particularly important because it will allow the City Council to support our efforts by holding the NYPD accountable for implementing our recommendations, which will lead to improvements in the way they do business and protect civil liberties and rights of all New Yorkers. As public officials, you have an opportunity and the authority afforded to you as members of the Council to demonstrate your commitment to increased police accountability and ensure that the important reforms we propose become reality. I want to thank you for your continued support and interest in the work of DOI's Inspector General for the NYPD. I'm now going to turn it over to Inspector General Phil Yor for a more detailed discussion of our investigative work. And after that, we both look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Inspector General, do you have written testimony to hand out? Uh, yes, I believe we did hand it out. Or they, it's, do we, can we have those written testimony? Go ahead. Great, thank, thank you. you. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Chairpersons Gibson and Gentile and committee members. I'm Philip Yor, the Department of Investigations and Inspector General for the New York City Police Department. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to testify today. I'm eager to tell you about the work that we've been engaged in in the last four years, its impact on the policies and practices of NYPD, and how we have helped New York City continue to be a national leader in the field of police accountability. In many ways, with the passage of Local Law 70 in 2013, the members present here today are responsible for having established a model of police oversight and accountability while cementing a commitment to constitutional policing and public safety for all New Yorkers. That legislation was based on a simple premise that remains relevant today. In a city as diverse as New York, with the police department as large as NYPD, vigorous external review is needed to ensure that the police keep the city safe while remaining responsive to community concerns. The IG's mission is to enhance the effectiveness of the department, increase public safety, protect civil liberties and civil rights, and increase the public's confidence in the police force, thereby building stronger police community relations. We believe that we have made important strides towards accomplishing all of these goals in the last four years, and we look forward to continuing to build upon that work in the years to come. When we first set out to build this unit following my appointment by Commissioner Peters in March 2014, it was clear that success would be rooted in a diverse set of skills. Our multidisciplinary staff has a range of professional experiences, including attorneys, investigators, auditors, police oversight specialists, former law enforcement, criminal justice researchers, policy analysts, and others. We have learned about many issues through our continual outreach work in which we have had meetings with a variety of community groups, advocates, and local organizations focused on criminal justice reform. Our office has presented before precinct community councils and grassroots organizations, and we have ongoing meetings and briefings with high-ranking NYPD officials, police union representatives, and individual officers themselves. In the past, Several years, we've also produced nine reports that have examined a number of critical policing issues. From our very first report on officers' use of chokeholds and the frequent lack of resulting discipline, to our most recent report on U visa certifications issued to undocumented immigrant victims of crime, we've been grounded in the reality that policing in New York City is complicated and urgent. But protecting individual rights and fostering public confidence must also be at the core of NYPD's goals. The other topics we have investigated include surveillance of political activity, use of force policies and practices, the use of body cameras, the relationship between quality of life policing and felony crime in New York City, the use of data from lawsuits to improve the performance of both individual officers and the department overall, inefficiencies in how NYPD investigates public complaints, and NYPD's approach to dealing with people in mental crisis. Approximately eight months after this office published its first report on the use of force by NYPD in, in January of 2015, the department released, excuse me, 
after, ex 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 properly, approximately eight months after this office published its first report on the use of force by NYPD, and that report was, uh, was published in uh, October of 2015, the department issued a set of revised policies that more precisely defined the use of force, as well as a more detailed tracking form. All uniformed members of the department are now required to use a threat, resistance, or injury form, a TRI form, uh, whenever they use force or witness another officer using force at the scene. NYP uses the data from these TRIs in publicly reporting about the department's use of force, as is now required due to legislation passed by the City Council last year. As a result, the public has access to data it never did before. Previously, NYPD's release of use of force data to the public was intermittent and ad hoc. This information is vital to assessing and improving tactics, training, policies, supervision, and discipline involving the use of force by police. Accurate and detailed reporting on police use of force also impacts public confidence in the police by providing greater clarity on why officers use force. We will soon, the release, we will soon release the results of our follow-up investigation into NYPD's compliance with the new TRI mandate. In 2016, we published another significant report. It was the first independent, data-driven investigation into the relationship, over time, of what is known as quality of life enforcement and felony crime. Our team analyzed over 1.8 million quality of life summonses, 650,000 quality of life misdemeanor arrests, 600,000 felony complaints, and 200,000 felony arrests over six years. We found that between 2000 10 and 2015, there was a dramatic decline in quality of life enforcement with no increase in felony crime. In fact, felony crime, with few exceptions, declined along with quality of life enforcement. Furthermore, we found that quality of life enforcement was not evenly distributed across the city. Instead, in 2015, it was concentrated in precincts with high proportions of black and Hispanic residents. New York City Housing Authority residents, and males aged 15 to 20. Later in 2016, we released another report, this time on NYPD's compliance with court-mandated rules known as the Handshoot Guide Guidelines for Surveilling Political Activity. The investigation found that NYPD, while able to articulate a valid base in, basis for commencing investigations into political activity, was often non-compliant with a number of the rules governing the conduct of these investigations. A federal judge from the Southern District of New York recognized the significance of this investigation when he cited a report in rejecting a proposed settlement from NYPD and other parties regarding police conduct going forward. The federal judge noted the report, quote, describes a near systemic failure on the part of NYPD to comply and that it is incumbent upon me to consider the report as relevant to and inconsistent with the NYPD's repeated contention that it always complies with the Hanshoe guidelines, unquote. As a result of the judge's reading of our report on NYPD's surveillance tactics, the party's proposed settlement in the Hanshoe case was revised to include a stronger role for the civilian representative in the surveillance decision-making process. In addition to these large-scale changes, we often see significant on-the-ground changes d during the course of our investigations and then as a result of our work. For instance, this past summer, we released a report concerning the department's process for certifying applications for U visas, special visas granted to undocumented immigrants who are victims of crimes and who also help law enforcement investigate and prosecute these crimes. As undocumented victims of crimes, these applicants are among the most vulnerable members of our community. As noted in the public response to our report, NYPD now provides applicants with greater information about why an application was denied and provides more instructions on what recourse the applicant can take. As a result of changes like these, the hundreds of people who now apply for a U visa every year with the department will have an improved experience with NYPD. In addition to our substantive reports, Every year in our annual report, we describe which recommendations NYPD has implemented or moved forward on and those it has decided not to adopt. Follow-up on these issues, both by DOI and this council, is critical. For example, in our report on crisis intervention training, we recommended that NYPD begin working towards a dispatch system in which the office trained 
Officers trained in crisis intervention are those who are sent to mental crisis incidents. We also recommended that NYPD substantially revise one of its current forms or develop a new permanent form to capture more useful data about mental crisis incidents. This analysis should be done in order to measure the extent to which CIT skills and policies are being used and followed by officers. To assess the need to revise the content of the department's CIT curriculum and policies and to identify the most prevalent mental health conditions in the city. By conducting fact-driven investigations, listening to the public's concerns, issuing sound recommendations, promoting accountability and transparency, and fulfilling the mission of Local Law 70, our goal is to help NYPD do an even better job. By doing a better job, job improved police community relations, increased confidence in the police force, and increased public safety, in short, real public reform, police reform, uh, in short, real police reform can be expected to follow. We encourage members of the City Council to continue to engage with us as we continue to bring New York to the forefront of effective independent police review. Thank you. Thank you uh, both. And um, we'll, we'll start with just some preliminaries um, and then we'll get into um, some of the other members and uh, Chair Gibson with, with her questions. Uh, first of all, um, about, the, about staffing within the um, Inspector General's Office for, um, for the uh, NYPD. Um, your first annual report in 2015 stated that you plan to have 40 to 50 staff members in, in investigations and in a policy analysis unit. Um, and as of March of 2015, 23 people had been hired, but since then there have been no new staffing numbers that we have seen. Um, can you update us on the on the staffing that you have in the in the uh, IG's office? Sure. Um, yeah. So we um, there are currently 33 full-time uh, staff members on board. Um, so those numbers um, that that you're, you're referring to from an earlier report are no longer uh, current. It, it, the, the, the current number is 33, and we have uh, a number of other uh, hiring processes in place. And those 33 are divided into those two units, or so? Yeah, so it's spread out. I mean, I can I can break it down for you. Um, w we have uh, three attorneys, um, and so uh, which are outside of that unit. Uh, with respect to the investigations unit, I believe we have uh, 13 people in jobs in the investigative unit and one vacancy um, in the policy unit. The other big unit. Uh, within the office, we have um, uh, 12 people who are currently in positions there with three vacancies. Um, and I, I can break down the types of jobs if you want. Uh, we also have an outreach person, and then we have uh, support staff of, 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 of five authorized positions, I believe. Uh, two of those are vacant. Now that's, how, that's how it breaks down, more or less, though. But so, so two main. Um, units of the office, the policy unit and the investigative unit, or where the bulk of the people are, policy analysts and, and investigators, respectively. Well, are there other units that I haven't identified? Uh, in terms of it being called a, a unit, no, not. It really is those two. Those are the two main units, and all the other uh, positions that I've mentioned are, are provide support to the whole office and to me. Right. Okay. Um, do you have plans to, to grow either or both of those units? No, I think we're probably, um, you know, in, in, in the range where uh, we've intended to be, and, and it's a matter of, you know, filling some of these vacancies and, and, and no, no discussions of, of growing uh, beyond the size that we are now. Uh, how, how, do you, how do you recruit staff to your office? Yeah, I mean, this is really big for us. Um, we do like, uh, we recruit staff and hire staff just like ever, other city agencies. We post on city job boards, we post to external sites. Um, you know, we are very um, much in touch with our uh, colleagues who do police oversight around the country. Uh, we go, and we're able to recruit people from, from within New York City and from outside of New York City due to these uh, connections. But it's a very vigorous effort um, to attract very talented staff that we have and people with backgrounds in whether it be in law enforcement, uh, police oversight, policy analysis, uh, analysis and, and, and so forth. We spend a quite a bit of our time um, recruiting uh, top flight talent. 
What, what percentage of, of staff have experience working in law enforcement? Um, in terms of the percentage over time, that would be hard to predict, but it's, um, you know, several, we've had several NYP, former NYPD officers who've worked for us before. Um, so it's, it, it, it probably, it probably, it has, you know, been several people, maybe it was 10% at some point, but it, you know, it fluctuates. And, and so you have former NYPD. Yes. Former federal experience? Uh, uh, well, I'm former federal okay. um, and former oversight, and, and uh, we've got some people that we uh, hired from other oversight agencies here in New York City and, and elsewhere. We, I believe our first year we were up and running, we hired three former um, CCRB uh, investigators. We hired a couple of people from the Commission to Combat Police Corruption here in New York City. Uh, we hired a couple of people from my former agency in D.C., um, and so, uh, and then in addition to all of that, you know, we've hired, you know, in investigators with various backgrounds investigating uh, for, uh, for other agencies here in New York City and, and, and other, other investigative organizations, uh, uh, the, the policy analyst. Uh, these are people uh, largely who have at least master's degrees, um, who have perhaps been doing criminal justice research. Um, um, studying um, uh, the, the academic, you know, pennings of, of, of many of the issues that we explore uh, as an office. So it's a really diverse set of skills that we bring to our office. It's a multidisciplinary effort um, where uh, we work in teams um, to produce the best possible reports. See, I just want to, Mr. Chairman, if I may, because uh, Inspector John Gore is being particularly modest uh, when he said he's former law enforcement. Um, Phil spent over a decade in a variety of very important positions at the Department of Justice. Um, he's too modest to say so, but I'm happy to do so. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> On the record. Uh, right. On the record. Right. <laughs> um, and, and particularly the reason I ask is because I, I have a sense that when um, you make recommendations to the police department, um, there may be some, if maybe not in all cases, but in some cases, the response m from the police department might include some questioning as to the investigator's qualifications to make, to credibly make those recommendations to the police department. Um, so how do you ensure that there's sufficient subject matter expertise relating to the issues that you investigate? I'm, I'm going to give you a very blunt answer, if I may. Um, having spent the bulk of my career in law enforcement, as you know, at the Attorney General's office and elsewhere, uh, there are, a wi as IG Ewer just pointed out, there are a variety of people with deep law enforcement backgrounds in, at the Police Inspector General's office. In addition, at the senior most level at DOI, all investigations are overseen by the Deputy Commissioner for Investigations, who in addition to over a, de to a decade at the NYPD has been running major law enforcement operations for more than a decade here. That is then overseen by my first deputy, who has spent over 20 years in various prosecutor's offices, including um, your former office, the Queen's DA's office. Uh, and all of that is ultimately overseen by me. I've spent my entire career there. And I will tell you that by the time reports are issued, they have been vetted at multiple levels um, by a large number of people with huge law enforcement experience. And although I am aware that there have been moments when people have suggested that certain recommendations um, are coming from people who are not qualified to make them, I find those suggestions offensive and essential, not from you, but from those who have made them. Um, and bluntly, while I am happy to have discussions with people about the right way to implement things, uh, there is absolutely no justification or basis, um, ha is not and never has been any justification or basis from, for anybody in any law enforcement position to question the qualifications of the staff at DOI. And so you, that extends across the whole agency, you're saying? Okay. Yes. Right. Great. Now, you, you testified, um, I'm not sure who testified, that you're required to report on completed investigations. Have there been investigations that, that were not completed? Uh, I mean, there are obviously well, any other than moment, those that are in, multiple, in progress. 
but have investigations been closed out as not completed? There, no investigation, and this is true for DOI as a whole, no investigation can be closed out as not completed. Obviously, there are at any given moment, both at, in the Inspector General for the NYPD's uh, shop as well as in every other IG shop, there are multiple investigations that are ongoing. Um, there certainly are instances in every IG's office where investigations will start and a determination will be made that it is unsubstantiated, meaning whatever we thought might be wrong wasn't wrong. I think that happens not just in every IG's office at DOI, but probably in every law enforcement office all over the country. Uh, we obviously do not issue re public reports on things that are unsubstantiated for any number of reasons, not the least of which is it wouldn't be fair to the people we are looking at to publicly talk about allegations that we've determined are not true. So if your question is, are there times when we receive allegations at DOI, both in, in the Inspector General's office and otherwise, that we determine are not true? Sure, but nothing gets closed until it's done one way or the other. Okay. So I mean, you can add to that if you want. But. Uh, that accurately <laughs> characterizes the process. Okay. All right, let's get into uh, some procedure then. Um, how do you identify an issue to investigate? Cool. Yeah, so um, we have, um, you know, we, we identify issues through a variety of means, first of all. I mean, we have a complaint intake function um, since uh, I, the, the first summer when I started up in 2014, I was engaging heavily um, with uh, community groups uh, that, that had uh, built up uh, some concerns with NYPD's policies and practices over the years, and, and, and it was a bit of a listening tour, going out and having groups come in and, and speak to us about some of their concerns. Um, uh, and I was also engaging w heavily with NYPD during that first summer as well, um, having presentations made to me by the heads of various units. So because I was relatively new to New York, the, the learning curve was steep, but it gave me a very good appreciation um, for some of the uh, the, the issues uh, impacting police community. Uh, are you saying NYPD asked you to look at certain things? Uh, well, I'm saying that when I met with these NYPD, they didn't ask us to look at things, but by <laughs> listening to their presentations, that was another source of information. Uh, they, they weren't asking for IG investigations, right. no, but, uh, but it clearly um, you know, educated us to the point where we, were, we would ask questions sometimes of these NYPD officials. Um, questions that came from or were on the minds of some of the community groups and in that this manner we had a better um, um, better information about some of the issues impacting policing in New York City and so let, let me say that there, we receive um, information about potential issues from a variety of sources um, since we've been open we've, we've had two cycles where we've have formed a project development committee uh, that has has factored in this information that we've received from a variety of sources uh, we've looked at local trending issues. Uh, we've looked at national best practices in policing and police accountability. We're, we're in constant in communication with our colleagues around the country. And the, the period of time that this office has been open happens to coincide with the period of time in American history where policing and police accountability issues have been very much in the forefront. Um, so, and so the Project Development Committee also takes into effect the complaint data that I mentioned. Uh, sometimes there are requests by external stakeholders, including council members. So uh, there have been requests from the council? Abs absolutely. Uh, and, uh, and, and so we take all of this, uh, all these factors in, uh, this Project Development Committee, um, all the while, you know, looking to our mission under Local Law 70, which is to enhance uh, the effect effectiveness of NYPD, increase public safety, uh, protect civil liberties and civil rights, increase public confidence in the police, and uh, we come up with a with a set of proposals or projects, and then uh, through a consultation process with Commissioner Peters uh, and his staff, uh, w we decide on cases that we'll we'll do for the next however many months. So this this is a you know a, a process uh, where uh, my, our, my talented staff, experts in the field of policing or police accountability. You know, are, are coming up with these project proposals and discuss and get input uh, from uh, Commissioner Peters and and and, his, and 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 DOI Commissioner Peters and his staff also come up with with ideas and recommendations which go into the mix and so it's through all of these um, means that we eventually come up with a set of cases that we'll be looking on. I'm just curious, other than the City Council, have other elected officials asked you or made requests? I. I believe it's been limited to uh, council members, uh, the request that we've received 
I'm looking over at my staff here, and they're, they're nodding their heads. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's been, uh, other than city council members, I, I don't think there have been others. Okay. Oh, now, yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, well, well. Yes. Well, I'm, no, no. So, I, so yeah, well, I'll, let me say that the, the, <laughs> good, the public advocate is <laughs> here, and we, we follow, uh, we, yeah, we have been working on issues mm -hmm. that they have identified, and body cameras and, 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 and other issues, and, and there have been absolutely, I, I take that back, so there, there have been references uh, through the public advocate's body of work. The record um, is corrected, public advocate. <laughs> just to, but, to and, and yes, and to add to that, um, I'm going to actually offer both a thank you to the public advocate, not only for the things she's asked us to look at in this, but a number of other aspects of the city that she's asked us to look at things that have both been important and one or two that I cannot discuss in public, but that I have great confidence over the next six months are about to become important. Um, she's nodding vigorously because I think she knows what I'm thinking about, but we'll leave it at there. But I, I want to take a second to thank her for um, a number of things that she's brought to DOI's attention generally. She's been a great partner. Great. That's so let me just ask you, uh, the city charter, um, section 803, um, indicates that, uh, that uh, both uh, internal affairs and CCRB are required uh, to report deficiencies in police practices to DOI. How does that interact with what you're doing? Right, so um, we are engaging um, constantly with those two agencies, both CCRB and NYPD. Um, and and through, through these discussions and briefings, uh, as, as I referenced before, sometimes we're able to um, identify issues, um, ask questions about issues that are pending. And so it, uh, the type of engagement that we've done with respect to the provision of the law that you've cited, is, 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 for the time being at least, is, is done on an informal basis. But we definitely care Inform about issues. Informal. Those, you know, informal. Informal. Yes. Mm -hmm. I see. Um, what, what, is, what is the procedure for requesting information and documents from the NYPD? How do you go about it? So we, we interact with uh, the, uh, 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 the Deputy Commissioner for Legal Affairs and his staff. Uh, and so um, they had actually, when we got up and running, uh, the, uh, the legal bureau, uh, the, that office sort of set up a le uh, uh, under its legal bureau, uh, an inspector general compliance unit. And so that's the entity, if you will, uh, within the legal bureau at NYPD that we interact with. And so when we want to uh, request documents, when we want to uh, request, uh, we want to seek uh, uh, interviews with NYPD personnel, um, 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 uh, certainly with respect to requesting documents, we uh, draw up a document request and send that off to NYPD, uh, and uh, you know, at, you know, at provide time frames within which we will try to get uh, those documents produced, and, and it, it's a process uh, that kicks in from that point. But it's it's a it's a formal these are formal document requests. Have you? If I if I may, Mr. Chair, I just want to clarify or add one thing because I know it's been an issue that's come up in this council before, not in the context of the police inspector general, but in the context of other inspectors general. So if I can add. Um, in many city agencies, we obviously send document requests to the general counsel's office because it's an efficient way to gather up materials. Um, but the law is really quite clear that every, every employee of an agency, the com from the commissioner on down, is responsible for producing documents. Um, and so to the extent that we go to, there is no, and I, I mentioned this because this came up in the context, in a different context, there is no concept of privilege as between the counsel to an agency and the rest of that agency and DOI. So that while we do frequently go through general counsel's office as an efficiency matter, um, neither at the NYPD nor at any other agency does the agency have the ability to refuse to produce documents um, on the grounds of privilege and the agency as a whole and the commissioner as a whole is ultimately responsible for compliance with those requests. Have you ever had to use your subpoena power? Uh, no. In this, in, in, in terms of yeah, I'll, the, I'll, in IG? Yeah, no, we have absolutely not. Um, I have a very good relationship with Commissioner O'Neill. Mm -hmm. uh, there certainly have been some growing pains, and there have been some instances where uh, we have not gotten 
production of documents and information as quickly as we wanted. But we have never had an instance where we did not get production of, we did not ultimately get production of documents and information. And although there have been instances where um, some resistance has slowed certain things, we have never had an instance where the failure to produce, where that resistance has significantly or substantively impacted an investigation. If there ever was an instance where we got resistance from the NYPD, from their legal unit or otherwise, that did substantively, um, that slowed an investigation in a substantive and significant way, uh, I would be back before this council informing you of that immediately. So in your estimation, uh, you've been granted uh, uh, sufficient access to information that you need to conduct the investigations? Yes, at times it has been slower and there have been some issues of resistance that we've had to work out, but they have all ma we have managed to resolve all of them uh, without the need for any further proceedings. Um, but obviously, as you know from events that occurred last year, if we ever determine either at the NYPD or at any other part of the city that we are not getting the cooperation necessary to do our jobs, um, you will be hearing about it. Now, the, the uh, Local Law 70 provided the mayor with the authority to uh, establish protocols for handling of um, sensitive information. Um, have those protocols been established? Uh, so far, they have not been necessary. What the law actually says is that if there is an issue with sensitive information, the mayor may establish protocols if necessary. Frankly, DOI, and this, is, this goes back to the original point, DOI is a law enforcement entity. Everybody working here is part of law enforcement. Um, and so there really has not been. I mean, law enforcement, like much, you know, law enforcement is used to dealing with sensitive information. We tend to do so in a pretty efficient manner. And so there really hasn't been a need for the mayor's intervention. Okay. So, so no protocols until that occurs. Yeah. The, the, those, the, what the law says is there can be protocols if there is a need for it. To date, we have not been denied information that we need. Um, actually, it doesn't say that you can deny it. It only says protocols on how to handle it. And so far, uh, the NYPD is a professional law enforcement organization. DOI is a professional law enforcement organization. Uh, Inspector General Phil Yor is a law enforcement professional. Um, the professionals have, man have are all capable of handling that confidential information in a secure way. And have so it. ultimately, is it in your bailiwick to dis determine whether something is pertinent to an investigation? Yes. It, it, ultimately, you make that call? Yes. Okay. Um, all right. I, we, we have some members, but I also want Chair Gibson to uh, have an opportunity to to ask her questions, and we'll get to our members, and I'll come back. Uh, on the subpoena issue, yes, go ahead. I, I think uh, Commissioner Peters I'm sorry. addressed your question about. Uh, sure. I think he. We, we assumed you were talking about subpoenas never having been uh, issued to NYPD, which is correct. Oh, yeah. We have issued subpoenas to third parties. To third parties, but not to the NYPD. Not to NYPD. Is never, absolutely okay. correct. Okay. So. Yeah. Thank you. That that's. I I apologize. I assumed you were talking about. It, yes, I was. I was referring to NYPD, yes. but. But okay. that's the case. Subpoenas have been issued, but not to the NYPD. Correct. Oh, okay. sure. Yeah. Right. Chair Gibson, do you want to? Thank you very much, Chair, and thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Inspector, for your presence and certainly your work. Um, before I get to my several questions, I just want to continue with the roll call for uh, the Committee on Public Safety. Thank you so much. Committee on Public Safety, continuation of roll call and intro 1267A, Council Member Espinel. I vote aye. Okay, the vote for approval now stands at eight in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and no abstentions. Okay, thank you so much. We're still keeping the roll open for other colleagues to join us. Um, just wanted to ask a few questions. Um, many of the investigations that were conducted by the office, um, there are times when there is an overlap with some of the issue-based policy reports that the IG has issued uh, as it relates to some of the CCRB policy issued reports. Um, so I think of the use of force and chokehold and uh, ultimately the subsequent use of force reforms that the NYPD adopted after the report was issued. Uh, what I wanted to find out from your office is, is there an effort 
with the Office of Inspector General to collaborate on investigations at all with CCRB. So what happens if there are simultaneous investigations going on related to the same policy issue like use of force chokehold um, and there are both entities issue recommendations that do have an overlap, how does that work or how has it worked specifically with the uh, chokehold topic? So we've not sought to collaborate with okay. CCRB in any of our investigations in terms of uh, issuing a joint report. That said, I want to you know, assure the council um, that we have excellent uh, relationship with the CCRB uh, and when we uh, uh, request information uh, from them um, in, in connection with one of our reviews. They provide that information uh, to us. And we have uh, good ongoing discussions with CCRB. We, we, we know some of the issues they're working on. They, they have a sense of some of the issues we're working on, you know, based on uh, some of our, our, our document requests. But, you know, our, our position at, at, at DOI has been that, you know, when we issue a report, it, it's, it's a, uh, at least with respect to the police IG, it's a, it, it's a report, you know, coming from okay. DOI. Yeah. Right. So does that work both ways? You said that CCRB does get requests from your office as it relates to documentation. Yeah. Do you get requests from CCRB as it relates to documentation as well? I'm trying to remember how many. Okay. I don't. Not I mean, no. For whatever, remember that under the uh, charter, the CCRB has a reporting obligation to DOI. Right. DOI does not have a reporting obligation okay. to CCRB. Mm -hmm. So as a general rule, um, DOI does not get document requests from other people. We obviously share our information with prosecutors where we make a determination, like any law enforcement agency, when we make a determination that a case should be handled criminally and charges are filed, we share that information with prosecutors, but otherwise we do not share in information that comes into DOI does not then okay. go out in document requests. Okay, no, good to know. Um, the community intake mechanism that you have, can you expand a little bit on that? Uh, so it's, it's, it's a complaint function. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, you know, which was, uh, 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 you know, part of the, the process of, of, of opening up an office. And so through our investigative unit, um, we uh, received complaints uh, from the public uh, on well, mostly police issues, but uh, sometimes people end up uh, filing complaints with us that have nothing to do with uh, the police. It may, okay. may be a, a concern about a, a district attorney's office or even a private entity. Uh, so we get lots of complaints having to do with NYPD and many that ha do not have anything to do with NYPD. And, and we, we do an intake. We do it in person. We receive those complaints by email, by telephone, by fax. Uh, and, and, and we handle those uh, complaints uh, appropriately. Okay. How do you, if at all, do you promote the various ways that New Yorkers can submit information to your office um, if it's NYPD or if it's any other agency where there is a complaint, uh, email, text, I'm sorry, not text, <laughs> telephone or fax. Um, how do you promote that? So the reason I ask is because obviously in public safety, in my capacity, I work very closely with CCRB and I know they have embarked on a very ambitious outreach effort, um, not necessarily an outreach in every single borough as an office specifically, but there are um, outreach workers that attend precinct council meetings each month and there are efforts that they have embarked on to really promote the work that the office does. So how do you promote the work that your office does and really provide a mechanism where New Yorkers can engage with you uh, as it relates to any issues that they may have? Well, with respect to the actual um, information about complaints, th right. there's, there's, there's uh, information available on the DOI website. Um, right. Um, and you know, we engage. We have a full-time outreach person. We don't have as many outreach people as, as CCRB has with, with its much larger staff. Um, but um, and even though we only have a we have a single outreach person, we have other people, including the IG, me, mm -hmm. people uh, on various projects. Uh, other employees engage in some of this outreach as well, as appropriate. And we're, we're going out to meetings. Um, and sometimes we're engaging with community groups, um, legal service providers in the context okay. of reviews mm -hmm. that we're conducting and that's, that's a kind of outreach as well uh, where we're informing people um, of what we do and, and how they can file complaints. And so well, we have a very active you know, outreach uh, process uh, that, that extends uh, beyond the uh, job duties of the outreach coordinator. 
um, and, and we get out the word as best we can through those, those various means. Right. I would just to okay. follow up, and, and I agree with all that, just to note DOI as an overall entity, and this is part of the reason that it's so important that the that the council chose to house the inspector general here within DOI. DOI as an overall entity, of course, also has a number of outreach efforts, including, as you know, ads on the subways, ads on the radio. So yeah, we and yeah. uh, um, mm -hmm. all of which is designed to make sure that the public is fully aware of avenues through which they can submit complaints. Um, and you know, we are, as you know, very public about our reports, both the police inspector general and the inspectors general for any number of other agencies. Um, and that, too, by talking about this publicly and being public about it, in addition to the advantages of transparency, it means that more people are, aw more people are now aware of what we're doing than in the past, and therefore we hear a lot more from people generally. Okay, I've seen those ads as well on the subway. Uh, I wanted to ask about the process after a report has been issued, um, the findings, the recommendations, um, the administration, do they get a heads up on recommendations that will be coming forth in terms of policy issues? Um, are they told in advance? And certainly, what is the process? While I know in the testimony you described, the police commissioner and his team have 90 days to respond in writing, but certainly is there advance notice? Are they aware of what's coming? And then how does that process work where there are areas in the recommendations of agreement, right? But what happens when they disagree, which I'm sure that happens with a lot of your recommendations, how does that process work? Well, if I may talk generally and then mm -hmm. and I'll let sure. um, Phil talk. This applies to every topic you do. <laughs> what, yes. That's just one. <laughs> right. So, you know, as a general rule, investigations that we do that do not involve some form, you know, that do not involve evidence that cannot be disclosed, grand jury, obviously issues where there's grand jury secrecy or we're sitting on wiretaps or things like that can't be disclosed. But where the investigations do not involve are sitting on wiretaps using grand jury, um, you know, or other surveillance techniques then we generally provide the agency and often city hall, depending on the importance, with a copy of the draft report in advance because the point here is to get changes made and the only way to get changes made is to go to people and say, here's what we're seeing that's wrong and hopefully get agreement up front to make changes. And so the police inspector general, like all our inspector general, general and, and I'll let Phil talk about it some more in a minute, we'll, we will, absent some reason not to, provide a draft of the report so that we can begin to get changes made. And then the second piece is follow-up. And one of the things that we will be doing more and more of in the next, in the second, the, my second four years, is making sure that we follow up so that we're an agency has said we are going to do something that in fact it's being done. And we've done, as you know, several reports recently pointing out where agencies have failed to follow up after agreeing to do something. And I think that's something you can see more of. Do you want to talk about yeah, the specific process? Yeah, no, that, I mean, that process applies uh, to the OIG and YPD, the police IG as well. I, I would just add that there's a very practical reason um, to, to get the input or show a draft of a, of a, of a report to NYPD in advance. Um, if we got something wrong, uh, we want to hear about it um, um, before we publish the report. Um, and in addition to that or related to that, the, the NYPD may offer um, explanations or responses uh, to the language they've seen, which as a result of their input, we then go back to the drawing board and we make the language even stronger. So there's a very practical reason for, for, for also for getting that, that input because it leads to uh, the production of better reports. And I can say having been in this field for 17 years, police oversight, this is a, a best practice, getting the input uh, of the police department on a, on a pending report before it actually goes out to the public. Okay. Uh, I also wanted to ask uh, specifically about the body-worn camera report that was issued um, and certainly the formation of the entire body-worn camera policy the NYPD put together a task force that was essentially internal members of the department. They consulted with John Jay, NYU, and others. The Federal Monitor had a lot of oversight. 
Um, was there any involvement from your office as it relates to developing some of the policies for the body worn camera, specifically since there was um, an investigation done and ultimately right. uh, recommendations that your office right. made as it relates to body worn cameras? Right. So, right, as you correctly point out, Council Member, uh, we, we, we did. Um, wrote a whole report on this mm -hmm. issue when, when we were commenting on what was then the voluntary body worn yeah. camera program. The um, pilot. The, the pilot program, thank you. Uh, and then the, there was this process that you've just referred to subsequently. We, we ended up, uh, yes, uh, providing input uh, through a written letter uh, as that process was proceeding. Okay, and as we're moving forward, um, obviously there's a time frame now by the end of 2019, which all patrol officers will be equipped with a body one camera. So as the process is playing itself out and the policies are in place, um, your office will be monitoring that process as we go along. Are you still working with the NYPD as it relates to that? Because obviously we've heard um, there have been several incidents of uh, police-involved shootings that involved police body-worn cameras, sorry, uh, it's a tongue twister, where the body-worn camera footage has actually become public, where we're able to see a lot of the footage of the officer's interaction. So because we know that this is an ongoing task that we're dealing with, is your office still involved in terms of the policies and the implementation as they expand and more officers are equipped with cameras? Absolutely. I mean, okay. we will, um, when we issue our next annual report, um, end of March, beginning of April of next year, you will see um, updates uh, on our recommendations. That's what I to know. And, okay. and this has been a, a, an ongoing process. I, think, I believe we issued our report, uh, it may have been uh, April or the summer of 2015, and so there have been a couple of I'm doing my math right. There have been a couple of annual reports that have come out in the interim where we've um, updated the public uh, on, uh, on, on whether or not uh, or the extent to which NYPD has adopted our recommendations. And we will continue to do that uh, in the body camera context and other contexts. And if we see the need uh, to do an additional review or a new review looking at new issues that have arisen in the body camera context that we didn't anticipate when we wrote our original report, we'll do a follow-up report. So body cameras are clearly a, a very an increasingly important part of American policing and, and we expect that that issue will re remain very prominently on our radar screen. Okay. I was expecting that there would be a follow-up since it is ongoing. Okay. I also wanted to ask uh, specifically the report that was issued that relates to monitoring and tracking political activities. Um, there were a number of deficiencies that were identified in the police department's internal systems that relate to case management and ultimately tracking. Tracking activities, tracking investigations, and, and certainly looking at the department and some of the systems that they have in place to monitor and track activities, improvement is always needed. So what I wanted to understand is, are you working or in terms of overseeing that process for updating the NYPD's tracking and monitoring system. Since your report identified some of the deficiencies and there's work that needs to be done, are you still involved in the process to make sure that those improvements can be achieved? Um, I, I just want to, sure, so let me. Um... And you talked about it a little bit in the, your testimony as it relates to the handshoe agreement. Yes. So. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the most important thing to point out is that as a result of the report that with the investigation that we did, which was a very detailed investigation and exactly the type of thing that I believe Local Law 70 anticipated because it was the kind of investigation that needed to be done by an independent entity but also by a law enforcement entity. No non-law enforcement entity could have had access to the kinds of sensitive files that we had access to. Um, the first thing to point out is as a result of that investigation, a federal judge rejected the NYPD's proposed new settlement on Hanshu. So there was an immediate and significant impact because a federal judge rejected it. And it is, um, I will say from my experience as a lawyer, extremely rare for federal judges to reject um, injunctive settlements like this. It's a very rare thing. The federal government, the Federal judge, nonetheless, based on our report, rejected the NYPD's proposed settlement and insisted that they go back and do it again, which they did. Um, the whole advantage to having 
a permanent inspector general for every city agency is so that you may assume that any time we issue a report of significance, whether it involves the NYPD or NYCHA or the Administration for Children's Services or any other part of the city, you may assume that if there are significant problems found, that DOI is keeping track of whether the agency is fixing them, is monitoring that, and if we determine after an appropriate amount of time that changes are not being made, we will do a follow-up investigation and, as appropriate, issue follow-up reports. And that is something the Council should assume is going to be true for every agency. And as I said, um, by early next year, we will, in fact, more proactively be publishing uh, some of these results. Great. And I guess my final question before I turn it back to my co-chair is in terms of the responses of the NYPD to your investigations that sometimes propel policy and procedure changes, um, revamping the patrol guide and other measures that have already happened to date, um, remaining completely independent as you need to be, is your office ever swayed by some of the responses that the department essentially does? So what I'm asking is, are you ever affected in the work you do by the response of the NYPD sometimes? Because we'll never always agree, and there are many times when your investigations have propelled policy and procedure changes, but there are instances where in your investigations have not propelled policy changes. So I'm asking, is, is there any difference in the way you are doing your work following an investigation because of the way the NYPD responds to your investigations? Sure. No, that's a great question. Okay. I, think I said that and I'm not confused because it sounds confusing. No, no. I, okay. I understood you entirely. I think it's a great question. Um, and I think that, that Inspector General, you are sort of hit on this when he discussed the fact that that there's sort of a two-step process, and this is true both with the NYPD and other agencies, um, which is first we will share these reports with the NYPD before they are made public so that we can get feedback from them. And then there's the formal mechanism by which the NYPD, unlike other agencies, has to issue formal feedback. As a general rule, by the time we get the formal feedback, we're not super surprised by what we're being told because we've spoken to them informally. There certainly have been instances, both with the NYPD and other agencies, where we have shared a draft report and the agency has come back and said to us, given us additional facts that have caused us, like any thoughtful investigators, to rethink particular points. So do we, you know, are we willing to look at additional information? Yes, always. It's what we do as investigators. Um, once the report is final, you, you can essentially assume that once a report is final, it means we have considered everything and we are absolutely comfortable with the position we've arrived at. Okay. Thank you very much. I'll turn this back over to Chair Gentile. Thank you. Great. Thank you, uh, Chair Gibson. We have some members who have questions uh, before the panel. I will start with Council Member Brad Lander. Thank you very much to both chairs for uh, organizing this hearing. I think it's very uh, productive and obviously, uh, you know, fitting to be doing four years after we passed Local Law 70 to create the office. Uh, thank you, uh, Commissioner and Inspector General Yor, for being here and for all the work that you have done uh, to establish the office in such a strong way. It really is um, very encouraging about how government can work. Uh, given all of the debate that uh, the chair discussed and the anxiety about how this would work, to see it stood up in such a strong way that is fulfilling both the let's make the NYPD uh, work better and help it do that and the civil rights mandate that is in the law as well. I think there was real skepticism that something could exist that had a civil rights goal that was responsive to the moment that we were in um, but that also is genuinely going to work hard to be constructive. And I just don't think there's any doubt that that has proven to be true. Um, and I think that's in very large part because of the, the way you've stood the, the office up, the seriousness with which you've taken it. And I think the examples you gave of use of force uh, and then especially of the uh, Muslim surveillance and hand shoe and impact on the court have just shown that the, the real possibilities of this office. So I feel very encouraged uh, by it. Um, 
what I want to ask about first is some of the, uh, the challenging spots in moving forward. And um, I guess this is about areas, and, and the chairs both asked about this in some different ways, where there either isn't an agreement to move forward on a recommendation uh, by the NYPD, or maybe where there is, but we don't have enough clarity on how that's going to uh, move forward. And I'm just going to give one example, I guess, ask you to talk about it, although if you have others. Um, in your report on policing around people experiencing mental distress, you pointed out what, what I have come to think is the key problem still there, which is not that a lot of officers aren't being trained, but that there's no system for trained officers to be deployed quickly to an incident. And even since that report, we have seen a number of times uh, people killed in an instance where there, there were uh, trained officers nearby, but the system did not get them uh, to the scene. And that still seems to me to be an area where there's not yet, I haven't yet heard publicly or, or privately either, uh, an, an acknowledgement of that real problem by the department or clarity on what to do about it. So it's sitting there in the report. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess both specifically, if you could address that example, and I guess I want to flag as many other examples where they have taken the recommendations and moved productively forward, use of force probably being the best example. So I, I don't want to imply that I think this is kind of the, the norm. I think the norm is recommendations accepted and move forward on, which is great. Where that's not the case, as in this case, you know, uh, tell us a little about what's happening there and then just generally how we can work together with you. That was sort of the goal of the office was as a, a joint project of the administration and the council to be able to make change, how we can work together uh, to push it forward. Right. I, I think it's a great question and I think the last part of your question is, is deeply important. So I, I want to sort of start it and I also want to thank you for the kind words. Um, Obviously, there are a number of things that DOI, in, with all of our inspector generals, can do to make changes. In some instances, obviously, we're talking about investi we do investigations which lead us to determine the criminal actions have taken place. In some ways, those are the simpler ones to deal with because where we find criminal behavior, we arrest people. On the, the more challenging issues are things such as the ones you've mentioned where we do an investigation and we see things that are a problem but you know, they require changes to the agency. And the one you mentioned about folks in uh, emotional distress um, is a great example. And the council can be, and I think in many instances has been, and I would encourage the council to be even more so going forward, a real partner in this because we issue a report. Our job is to go and find facts and present those facts to the mayor, to the council, and to the public. Um, and to make recommendations based on those facts. In many, many instances, the agencies, including the NYPD, accept those recommendations. Uh, the NYPD has accepted far more recommendations than they have not, um, and that's great. And then, then the job for us at DOI is to follow up and make sure that they're implementing that. And one of the things I think you'll be seeing in the next four years is additional attention to the extent to which an agency, be it the NYPD or any other, having said, yes, we're going to do X, then went ahead and did it. And to give you an example, um, after our use of force report, uh, the NYPD agreed to, to now begin tracking force in every instance through using, uh, as Inspector General Yor said, uh, what's called a TRI form. So the next question is, is the NYPD in fact doing that every time? And that's something we are looking at, and when our results are done, we'll be reporting them um, to the council. There are instances, and the one you gave is probably the most stark, where the NYPD has not accepted our recommendations. And at the end of the day, that is the place where we most, where it is most important for us to be partnering with the council, because you have that report, we present that report to the mayor, we present that to the council, and so the council has the opportunity to read that report. If you have questions, obviously, uh, we frequently get questions from members of the council informally who just call and say, I have a question. But you also have the ability for any of our reports to say, we want to ask our questions in a more formal way by having a hearing. Um, and then the council has, the council, as you know, the elected legislative body uh, and will of the people, has the ability ultimately to engage in legislative, you know, if the council determines that the NYPD needs to do something and they are not based on our report, then that's an opportunity not only for hearings but ultimately for legislation if the issue is serious enough. And so what I would say is 
while obviously you, we want to be mindful, everybody wants to be mindful of not micromanaging aspects of policing because it is a big department with many different things going on, where we issue a report, and we only issue reports about things that we think are serious. We do not issue reports about everything because the world would grind to a halt. Where we issue reports about things that are serious and the NYPD says we are not gonna do it, I think that's exactly the moment where the council is most crucial because you, you as the council then can review that report and can decide either we agree with the NYPD, we're not concerned, or you can say we are concerned, we don't agree with the NYPD. In the first stage, let's have a hearing so the council could hold a hearing and say why are you not, do you not have a proper mechanism in place for getting officers to respond? And if after that hearing the council was still concerned, you have the ability ultimately through legislation and other means to insist on changes. Uh, thank you. I know there's colleagues who want to get to questions as well, so I won't ask uh, others. But I'll just flag this issue kind of both specifically around the issue of deploying trained officers to those situations as like one really important unachieved recommendation. Um, and that I look forward to working uh, with the, the chair who's continuing uh, and, and thank uh, Vinny as well um, in doing some of this kind of follow up on the, in the next term. So thank you. Great. Our uh, next set of questions will be by Council Member Giovanni Williams. Thank you very much. Um, appreciate it, both chairs. I see uh, there's no time limit, which is dangerous, but I've got to be uh, responsible. Uh, it's just a, an honor to be here and to have uh, this interaction. It is humbling uh, to be here, to know that uh, myself and my colleague in particular had a strong voice in, in getting this done. But, and at that time period, I just want to make it clear, um, the whole world was going to end if we did this. The sky would literally crack open and brown and black young people who are going to wreak havoc on the city and, and the inspector general in, in particular was going to confuse all police officers they would have no idea uh, who to listen to the inspector general or the commissioner all these things were just going to destroy the city uh, a few years later not only has it not happened the city is actually in a much better place uh, in terms of policing uh, we obviously and I'll continue to push because we have some ways to go but it's always interesting in pointing that out because every time we have these conversations about these type of topics, those fears are always pushed forth, yet they've never come to fruition. And each time people have had the fortitude and courage to move forward, only good things have happened. So uh, I'm just humbled to be here. And you've actually referenced some additional bills that I've got uh, done in, in your, um, in your um, testimony. Appreciate that. I did, did want to correct one thing. But, uh, it's comprehensive uh, and impact of his police commissioner before his committee, the driving force that pushed to pass local law 70. Just wanted to clarify, uh, we have a great uh, safety chair now. When we got the bills passed, it was not the committee that pushed it out. We actually had to discharge past the committee <laughs> to get it straight to the floor. <laughs> I just wanted to clarify that uh, for the record. Also uh, for the record. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but I'm thankful now that I'm, 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 assure, I'm sure that if this, this particular bill was coming through this committee, uh, we would not have to do that, and the committee uh, would work the, how we would hope to work on these issues. I just have a, a couple of questions. Uh, the first one, uh, and thank you for your report on how PD responded, uh, responds to EDPs. Um, I think you had a lot of uh, good ideas. Uh, my colleague mentioned a few of them. My hope is that they'll take you up on some of them. Um, it's just critically important that we don't treat them uh, as criminals and, and have different responses than we would do um, if we had criminals. I'm even thinking maybe we need a, a different number than 911 so that people can call that and maybe it would trigger just different type of response in people's minds because 911 is known for uh, usually criminal emergencies. Maybe we need something else uh, for EDP emergencies. Uh, I just, we uh, at the council, uh, particularly after uh, there was a shooting in my district of Mr. Dwayne June, whose family called for assistance and he was shot and killed. That is an ongoing investigation. Uh, but we called for uh, a task force on um, not just NYPD's response, but a, in a response to how the city responds to EDPs in general, including NYPD. The mayor originally said no, uh, thanks to uh, the, the council pushing. He, he did say yes, and we're waiting to hear when that task force is going to be either convened 
or reconvene because he had something similar. I just want to know if you heard any information about that. Were you aware of it? Do you have any information of when that is supposed to happen? Um, we are not. Uh, we, have not, we are not involved with that task force, so I don't have any information in, on that task force. Um, I think obviously it is an important idea. What I would say, and, and Councilmember, you and I have actually discussed before, the task force is important, but I believe there are already some things that we know need to be done, and so I think it is important at the same time that the task force go forward, and I commend you for pushing it, that we also not lose sight of the fact that there are some things in our report, most notably the one that Councilmember Lander mentioned, um, which is the need to have a better mechanism for getting the officers who are trained in dealing with folks with uh, mental and emotional crises to the right scenes. Um, I think it is important that we not lose track of the need to actually execute on and implement the things that we already know need to be done and that DOI, after a very extent, I mean, that, you know, Inspector General Yor and, and the folks in that IG's shop put a huge amount of time into that, and I think it's important that we not lose track of the work that's been done and the things that we already know need to be done, um, even at the same time that we're considering to think about other options. Um, I don't disagree. Um, I, I do want to ask, have they, have they said why, what's taking so long to make that happen? Is it primarily not enough officers are trained? Or is it, there doesn't seem to be connective tissue from the dispatcher being called at 911 to the proper precinct to the people who have been trained. So is there, is there any other problem getting that connective tissue happening? Have they responded to what that issue is? As I understand it, it's, it's, it, it's a cost issue and a logistics problem. I don't, I don't think I've ever heard anyone from NYPD say that's a bad idea. Uh, to have a, a centrally located dispatch system. I, I think it's, it's, it's a matter of, of largely of logistics that they've sort of have, uh, have come up with a uh, improvised system uh, where they're uh, making available at the start of each tour uh, officers who are CIT trained um, so that, um, so that, uh, that that's known um, at, at the beginning of each tour of duty, um, but it's not fully electronically integrated in the way that we've, we've proposed the dispatch system. So I, I think they want to do the right thing. They, they need more encouragement, and, I, and, uh, and I, I mean, I'm sure the council can provide that. Yeah, I'm into encouragement, so uh, <laughs> uh, we'll try to do that. Uh, thank you. I just want to add what I do agree. We have to make sure um, that those officers are there. I, I believe that while officers should be on the scene, my hope is that we can get into a point, get to a point uh, where it is not officers necessarily uh, being the first point of contact that has trained people uh, who have uh, an, a mental health background uh, to perhaps be there and try to make an initial um, initial uh, interaction with police officers there as as um, support. That's that's my hope that would eventually happening. Uh, so second of three questions, I just want to know if there's a status update on the implementation of 119D. Uh, which was a, a bill that was recently passed, um, lawsuit on transparency using civil action data to detect patterns and improve policing. Any update on that? So uh, the, 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 law, the bill is law now, and you know, we're coming up with a plan. I believe our first report is due at the end of April. Uh, we're working on something that will, co will comply with the, the, the new law, and we'll be reporting out uh, litigation data in the years to come as well. Thank you. I'm uh, very much uh, looking... Uh, to read that, uh, hopefully in a particular capacity in April, uh, but in whatever capacity I'm in, uh, I'm looking forward to uh, read that report. Uh, and the last, it's a, I think we are at a place where we have a, a, a particular administration and a mayor and a commissioner who are helping move, turn this boat around. We have to turn some more. But I, we obviously get concerned uh, if there's another administration. Um, obviously, one of the reasons we, we put it under DOI was to make sure it fit with the existing law, but one of the dangers is that the administration can come and cut everything that uh, both of you have built. And, and Commissioner, uh, you've been doing a great job, and obviously part of that is hiring talented people. people. You identified a very talented uh, person, and, and uh, Mr. Yu, I just, I'm just thankful for the work you've done and the Commissioner. I'm just worried about what happens to another administration that doesn't believe uh, what we believe. Is there any other safeguards that you can think of or have thought of of how we can protect the work that's being done uh, and the resources that are being given? Well, I mean, obviously, yes, election, as, as we have all seen um, last year, elections have consequences. 
Um, I would say that part of the re we have we have I have Inspector General Yor has the senior staff at DOI have everybody at DOI has spent a lot of time not only doing individual investigations but building an infrastructure and a system um, that is hard to ignore, hard to walk away from, and hard to tear down. I think that why I think that it would be you know, as as you mentioned a few minutes ago, I think that if the if Local Law 70 came to a vote in this committee now, it would pass overwhelmingly with few of the difficulties that you encountered you encountered four years ago. I think similarly, um, and I want to give uh, the administration a great deal of credit. When I uh, first took over at DOI, we had a little under 400 staff. We now have close to 700 staff. Um, I think that it would be very hard, and we are all committed to spending the next four years and perhaps longer doing that. I mean, one of the things, remember, the city charter uh, says that the commissioner of DOI is uh, nominated by the mayor, confirmed by the council, and serves essentially not a particular term. But I think that even four years from now, if a new administration were to come in and there were to be a new commissioner or a new inspector general for the NYPD or any other agency, I believe it would be a lot harder to walk away from this work now and even more so in four years, given the structure that we are building, both in terms of specific reports and staffing and reputation. I'm not suggesting to you that elections don't matter. They matter deeply. But I believe that we are building something that will withstand considerable headwinds if we are ever confronted with headwinds. Thank you very much. Again, I'm looking forward to, to continuing the work. And this is uh, just another example of how important our local elections are. Just for those who are watching, many people pay attention uh, to the presidential elections. Um, which we should, because craziness can happen. Orange people can get elected and do crazy <laughs> things. But, uh, but we have to see what the differences election make locally. It could be the difference of having uh, an IG or not having an IG, or having a DOI, a commissioner who cares about it, uh, or having one that doesn't. So this is important. Thank you very much, and thank you to the chair. Thank you, Council Member uh, Williams. Um, Council Member uh, Rosenthal I had stopped in and put her name on the list for questions, but since she's not here, she may pop in again. Um, we're going to go on the next question, uh, questioner, uh, Council Member Bill Perkins. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, Commissioner, for being here. I'm uh, concerned about uh, s these reports that you made reference to and whether or not um, these reports looked into issues relating to prejudices, you know, that uh, very often a big problem in our city. and. Have you looked into those types of uh, issues and made reports related to that? I'm sorry, Council Member, your voice, your mic cut out. I um, lost half mm. your sentence. I apologize. Okay. You have made reference to reports mm -hmm. um, that you have issued. And I'm wondering have there been reports related to racial and other types of prejudicial uh, challenges, so to speak, uh, that we are occasionally experiencing in this city? Certainly. Um, there have been a number of reports that have touched on that. Uh, probably the most prominent was the uh, issue of surveillance of political and religious groups, um, which talked about, in particular, surveillance of mosques and uh, of mosques. Uh, we issued a very detailed report that Inspector General Yor talked about and, and can talk about in greater detail. Um, involving the use of quality of life, misdemeanor arrests and summonses, and, that, and the impact of that on uh, violent crime, but that also looked at uh, some of the racial and demographic components of that. Those are probably the two reports that most directly, the two most significant reports that directly impact that. Are there others? Those are the main ones. Yeah. And, and and, you know, we can't talk about pending matters, but I can... I'm I, sorry, could you... I, I'm sorry. Uh, in, in addition to what Commissioner Peters said, and, and although I, I'm not at liberty uh, to discuss, you know, pending uh, uh, matters uh, in, our, in our office, I, I can assure there you... There are pending matters that you're not at liberty to discuss? Let's hear those. <laughs> okay. So I, I want to assure you that, that, that having worked in this field and uh, addressed some of these issues of 
racial bias in, in, in policing that this is uh, uh, this issue is very much on the radar screen uh, of uh, of our office and we've got um, a bunch of cases that that, that 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 we're working on a variety variety of topics and you know over 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 time you, you will see a fuller body of work. So the uh, the reports that you have completed are they publicly available? Yes, absolutely. And. So can you give me an idea of some of them that um, you've completed that I might want to have access to? I'm sorry, some of the ones that, that, are, that you will have access to? Yes. Well, we've made, I think, some public declarations about follow-up reports. Right. Yeah. Well, um, all of our, every report that we have issued, we've issued how many? Uh, nine reports. All nine. nine of our reports are, when they are completed, they are issued publicly, they are put up on DOI's website, uh, they are made. They are issued to the public, and they are put up on DOI's website. So, if you go to DOI's website, all nine of those reports mm -hmm. are available, as well as an annual report that summarizes the work that was done that year, and also summarizes the NYPD's responses to that work. And those are all on our website. And do you have um, the, t the sort of the title of those reports? Sure. That you can share with us. Yeah. Sure. I've got. I can read. In the, is this a complete list? Yeah, yeah. Excellent. Um, as Councilmember Williams said, the, the first trick to being a good commissioner is to hire really good staff. The second, by the way, is to take credit for their work. Um, we issued a report on observations on accountability and transparency in 10 NYPD chokehold cases. That was in January of 2015. In April of 2015, we issued a report lawsuits and legal claims. In July of 2015, we issued, oh, thank you. Uh, a report on body-worn cameras pilot program assessment. In October of 2015, we issued a report on use of force de-escalation tactics and discipline. That, I might note, is the report that led to um, the NYPD agreeing for the first time to issue, to file forms every time a force is used. Um, we issued a report on quality of life enforcement. That's the one I referenced a moment ago. We issued an investigation of the NYPD's compliance with rules governing investigations of political activity. That's the surveillance report that I mentioned a moment ago. We issued a report putting in training into practice a review of the NYPD's approach to handling interactions with people in mental crisis, which is the report that um, Council Members Williams and Lander referenced. Um, we issued a report out, uh, addressing inefficiencies in the NYPD's handling of complaints an investigation of the outside guidelines complaint process. And then most recently, uh, this summer, we issued a report on undocumented, when an undocumented immigrants are crime victims in assessment of NYPD's handling of U visa certification requests. So those reports are available to the public? Yes. And um, so I wouldn't, I'd appreciate it if you can get those reports to me. Uh, we, we would be happy to send a, I, we would be happy to have a copy of each of those reports sent directly to you today. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Are you done, Councilman? Yes. Did you finish your question? Yes. Thank okay. you. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, thank you Councilmember uh, uh, Perkins. Um, not seeing Councilmember Rosenthal. Um, we'll just let me just go back and uh, add a few more uh, inquiries here. Um, let's, let's take one area where it's my understanding that the NYPD has rejected uh, your recommendation in the, uh, in the reporting of lawsuit data, um, wh whereas you recommended the use of the rail system um, and they continue to want to use, I guess, what's called an EIS system. Um, now, they re that's a rejected recommendation, my understanding. And you talked about maybe using legislation as a result of rejected recommendations. I is this an area that you would suggest that be the case? Well, and I'm going to ask um, Inspector General Yor to talk in greater detail about this particular report and the recommendation. Um, I think I, I want to be careful not to overstep um, what is our job as opposed to what is yours, um, nobody having voted for us. Uh, we issue reports with what we believe are detailed factual findings 
Um, I don't know that it is not our place to then tell the council what legislation they should enact. It is our place to tell the to provide the council with full facts. No, granted, granted. But assuming that that were the case, would you see that as an appropriate um, response to a, a rejected recommendation in this in in a, in a matter like this? Um, this of, of this I magnitude. Think, sure. I, I think in the first instance, I would always suggest that in the first instance the proper response from the council would be to hold a hearing and to have the NYPD in other words before going and writing a bill I would suggest the first thing to do if there is a re recommendation that we make that is rejected that the council is concerned about I would say that the first thing to do is to call a committee hearing and to insist that the, N that the relevant um, personnel at the NYPD attend the hearing and answer questions as to why they rejected something and why they believe it was appropriate to reject it. If after that hearing you are satisfied with their answers, then we move on. If after that hearing you remain unsatisfied, then I think it makes sense to think about legislation. But in the first instance, I would always urge the thing to do with any of our reports, and this is true whether we are talking about the NYPD or any other agency. If there are recommendations made that are of concern to the council and not, and that we don't report are being implemented, the first thing I would recommend is to have that agency's commissioner testify before the council as to why that wasn't done. So uh, the, the magnitude of the issue that's rejected is not really pertinent in your viewpoint. It's just whether or not the council feels it's sufficient enough to hold a hearing. Well, well I think that, that implies a certain concern about magnitude. Obviously, uh, there are, you know, obviously, one thing that would factor into your decision is not only do we agree with what DOI said, but how important do we think that is? I, I would not suggest that every recommendation that DOI makes, either in the policing context or anywhere else, are they are all important. If things that we think are not important, we don't. There are plenty of things we can say that we don't because they're not important. If we say it, we think it's important, but obviously you need to make a just determination as to where you want to place your emphasis. Okay. And I know you were giving an example uh, where the NYPD has not accepted all of our recommendations, but to be fair to NYPD in the litigation data report that you refer to, um, they have made some steps, taken some steps which have warranted a, 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 a partially implemented designation from us. And we asked them to take a look at your data, whether it be uh, claims information uh, uh, flowing through the comptroller's office or lawsuits, you know, being filed with the city. We asked them to do a qualitative review of that, and they, they're, they're not doing everything we asked them to do on that, uh, and they're doing it more of an, in an ad hoc fashion, uh, but they're, they're doing more now than they did before we wrote our report. Um, likewise, uh, in, in the context of that specific uh, report and our recommendations, um, we, we asked them, we, I think our recommendation was we asked the, them the NYPD to set up a working group or committee along with the comptroller's office um, and, and the law department. Um, and although they did not constitute a committee like that, they have assured us and we've seen evidence of lots of communications going on, bilateral and otherwise, amongst that group uh, that, that, that are leading to positive results. In addition to all of that, as, as I referred to uh, in response to an earlier question, um, we'll have the opportunity to issue our first 119D report uh, in, in, in April. So that will, that will provide additional information to uh, the mayor, the council, the public, and NYPD about what's happening, um, where things are dragging, and, and what more needs to be done. Um, and we will also be, uh, in, in our annual report that will come out a few weeks probably before that report, we will be updating um, the public about um, the status of these recommendations. Um, so you correlate the additional movement by the NYPD uh, to, uh, to the original recommendation well, that you made? We're always hopeful. We're actually about to begin the process now of, of engaging with them to see, okay, what's happened since the last annual report. And going forward, DOI has plans to provide uh, more real-time updates to the public uh, with respect to the IG's work, and, and I think that will be a, a, a valuable service. Uh, but as things stand now, we will certainly be updating the public uh, in our next annual report with respect to our pending recommendations from previous reports. And that's in the spring, right? Yeah, end of, end of March, beginning of right. April, yes. Right. I'm, I'm curious about the, the, this uh, classification of accepted in principle. 
Um, what, what does that mean, except that in principle, uh, practically, what does that mean? So um, I can't think of an example offhand. I know we've used that language. I can't think of an example offhand. Maybe it'll come to me as I'm sitting here. But, um, and we've, we have, um, you know, experimented with different language. Um, and I, I think that, that we've used that term where uh, NYPD has told us that uh, they, they, they agree that the, the recommendation is sound, um, that it's something they want to do and will do, but perhaps are awaiting uh, certain um, you know, logistical uh, requirements to be met or other circumstances to arise before they can actually implement it. So that's a good thing. It's not, it doesn't get us all the way to the goal line. But you and anticipate it happening. We anticipate it happening. Um, you know, but to be completely transparent, I think that we have, there have been instances, to be honest, where, and we report on all this, it's not a secret, um, but there have probably been instances where something has gone from accepted in principle to something less than accepted in principle. Um, and you can track that over time. So we, 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 you know, we're as honest, as candid, um, as accurate as, as we can be, but these, that's, a, that's an important um, um, thing to remember when you, when you, when, when, you, when you realize that these, uh, sometimes these recommendations, the status of these recommendations, it's very, it's very fluid and they can change, for the, usually for the better, but sometimes for the worse. Okay, so there are instances where it does not happen as, correct, even though in principle well, they agree. It, that would be right. documented in our right. work, absolutely. Okay. I want to take a minute to, uh, to evaluate uh, your success based on the um, the four mandates that are in local law 70 uh, and ask you to to evaluate those those mandates uh, how how has your success in, uh, enhanced the effectiveness of the NYPD it's a general answer it's fine but that's one of the mandates right. to enhance right. the effectiveness of the NYPD right so uh, when you're looking at our work the systemic work that we do ultimately you want a police department um, to be effective, and, 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 to, and to be effective, it needs to have the trust of the community, the confidence in the police, such that um, uh, people are feel comfortable reporting crimes uh, to, to the police department. The police department's not going to be effective uh, if it doesn't have the trust uh, of the community. And so, I would I would argue that you know, if you just look at the very specific issue of, of training. Um, which has been a consistent theme in our systemic work across various reports. Uh, we've pushed for better de-escalation training, uh, and, and we were talking about that in our use of force report from two years ago. We talked about it again in our CIT report that was issued at the beginning of this year. Um, we, we've been complimentary of NYPD on some of their training, which is actually quite good, and we've been critical of deficiencies in training as well. But I would argue that training is such an essential element of, of, of police reform that if, if an oversight agency, a department, the DOI can get NYPD um, to adopt better training practices, fill in the deficiencies, um, that ultimately is something that's going to make police officers and, and, and by extension the police department more effective. Um, so, so, so training, you could look across various reports, not even beyond the ones that I just mentioned to you. Um, supervisory controls would be another sort of uh, theme uh, across uh, many of the reports that we've written. Um, and uh, in, in the use of force uh, context, or I would say in the, in the U visa context, the report that we issued this summer, uh, we found that there weren't enough uh, supervisory uh, controls uh, with, with respect to that process. We've looked at supervision in the context of use of force uh, as well. Um, and, and, and uh, we've looked at, um, in, in the body camera context, I'm remembering the, the issue of supervisory checks. Uh, and that was actually brought to our attention by members of a, a, of a police union that we engaged with before we issued that report. So all of this is to say that for the police department to be effective, um, um, you know, one should be mindful of these themes that crop up across reports, whether it's training, supervisory controls, uh, more effective discipline, better policies. Um, and, I, I would, and I would argue that if, if someone looks at our reports, you'll see that we've hit heavily on, on, on these, these topics, uh, which go to not only the issue of the effectiveness of the police department, but the other areas you wanted me to how, touch on. How about, how about your mandate to uh, increase public safety? Well, 
it's all connected, as I say to mm -hmm. my staff. They're used to, they're used to uh, uh, me saying that. Um, but, um, you know, ultimately, um, New Yorkers are going to be safer uh, if people have the tr faith and trust in their police department, where they feel comfortable um, engaging with the police, reporting crimes, reporting criminals. Um, and so to give a recent example, the UVISA report again, um, there we looked at the, the, the processes in place for NYPD uh, to certify applicants for the UVISA program. Um, if you didn't have a program like that, you might have uh, undocumented people who, who, who were afraid of the police, afraid of the possibility of being deported, who did not support crimes. And so by us providing more transparency, more publicity, about uh, more um, information to the public uh, about the U visa process, I would argue uh, that that's a plus, that's a net gain in terms of increasing public safety uh, in New York. And I, I could draw examples from almost any of our reports to make similar arguments. So, okay, so, so the uh, U visa program uh, is part of what you're you're referring to yes right okay and and we you know we, we ch put a light on that process we we asked for for, for so there'd be more transparency more due process if you will with respect to that process if you have a, a u visa process that people believe in that's fair um that's going to ultimately lead to greater trust in the police department and, and better safety that, exactly right um, how about an example or two where you're mandated to protect several civil liberties, civil rights? Just right. So uh, again, uh, I mean, you could look at various reports. You could look at our 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 our, our use of force report, uh, where you know we you know looked at people who had filed, uh, or could go back to our first report, the chokehold report. Let me start with that. That was the very first report that we issued. Um, in uh, January of 2015, almost three years ago. Um, and we looked at uh, 10 recent chokehold cases, com uh, complaints, if you will, that had been substantiated by the CCRB when uh, complaints had been filed. And then we looked at how those cases fared once they got to the police department. And we were, you know, surprised uh, uh, and, and, and concerned, you know, in what we saw and how um, the, the charges had been uh, even matters, you know, that we had looked at, we had vetted, uh, we had seen the validity of these complaints after being analyzed by our team of former law enforcement officers and others in our office. We had found that many of these uh, CCRB complaints uh, did not fare very well once they got to the NYPD, which through its processes either downgraded or disregarded those charges. So I would, so I, I would, I would argue that that's the civil rights matter by, by shedding light on by, by shining light on, but it's a civil rights matter if, if you have a process where citizens are filing um complaints of excessive force or 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 or, or, con or expressing concerns about chokehold policies and and those processes and those complaints are not being substantiated and, and upheld I, I would argue that that's that's a civil rights issue um that said um how we treat um the most vulnerable people in our society um, in our, through, the, through our crisis intervention report that we issued earlier this year um, where we you know looked you know very system, systematically and did a deep dive into uh, the, the NYPD's policies and procedures and training on CIT I, I think if you talk to people in the mental health community and I agree they would say that's a civil rights issue how a police department treats the most vulnerable people in its society as well so th these are themes you know that have been coming up and will continue to come up in, in, in the work of our office. And, and finally, your final uh, mandate is to increase the public's confidence in the, in the police force. And in regard to that, I'm, I'm just curious because it, 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 you, to some extent, you're a third party in public police um, 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 relations, right? You're sort of a third party. So uh, how... how how as a third party do community, that you do the community outreach that results in improved police community relations? If I'm gonna, Please. just to give Phil a break from, yeah. okay. I, I think, and, and this goes to many of the points that, that Phil just made, there is part of the reason for having an inspector general of any agency, but in particular of an agency that interacts with the public a lot, and there's probably none, no more so than at the NYPD, 
having an inspector general, a third, an independent third party that can review practices, gives people both confidence in what the NYPD is doing and confidence that there is a place to go when they are concerned about what the NYPD is doing. And it is simply a truism that in order for government to function, it needs the confidence of the people. And that confidence is dramatically increased by having a inspector general doing vigorous work. So how does that improve police community relations? Because the community has greater confidence in what government is doing when they know that there is a third party entity that is looking at this, that is standing up and that is saying, here are problems, as we have done with the NYPD, with NYCHA, with ACS, um, with the Department of Correction. And that knowledge that that is going on is what I firmly believe contributes in a very significant way to public confidence in governmental institutions, and that's the cornerstone of any kind of relationship between any government agency and the and public. Well, couldn't the same be said, though, of CCRB being being uh, 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 an outside, um, s at least partially an outside group that that is a third party, so to speak, uh, uh, that people can go to? Sure, and uh, just if I may, sure. Uh, but one, the CCRB does something different than the police and the inspector general for the NYPD. The CCRB is handling individual complaints about specific police officers' conduct in certain areas. The inspector general for the NYPD, like the inspector general for every city agency, is looking at large systemic problems in the way that agency is run. The two are, they are just two distinct equal but both very important functions. So, you, but in, in, I'm sorry. You, I was just gonna say, just following up and directly tied to what Commissioner Peters said, um, the, in, engaging with these outside groups is, is a way of uh, and showing that there's an external party um, looking at these issues is a way that um, builds trust, but directly tied to that is the fact that we're issuing public reports, um, shining a big light on some of these issues that had previously, in some instances, been very secretive, and if people are reading these reports and looking at um, uh, our verdict, if you will, on various NYPD practices and where we compliment NYPD, I mean, we praise NYPD where they get it right. I think that's a way of, of, of building confidence in the police department th through the issuance of these public reports uh, that, that, that make the facts known of, uh, about police departments that haven't always uh, wanted uh, to have these practices uh, be in the light. Now, when you meet with these community groups, are they bringing you systemic problems, or, or are, they, are they bringing you more so individual issues that are happening maybe in their community or with their precinct or something of that nature, and they, they're choosing you over CCRB to make the complaint? I don't think it's productive to view this as an us versus CCO. Yeah, no, no, I don't suggest that, but I'm saying that if they make a complaint, yeah, yeah. The, the, for whatever reason, they choose yeah. to make the complaint to you. Right. Are, but are they making systemic complaints? Yes, absolutely. I mean, I, again, I, I point you back to the first summer I was here in 2014. I, would, I can't remember how many meetings I sat in during that summer with 10 or 12 people around our conference table, a coalition of people of, uh, with an interest uh, in, a, in a particular issue. And sometimes they'd have position papers um, and because they knew what we did and, they, they, and the CCRB wasn't the right place to go with, with respect to those complaints. Having said that, when we meet with community groups, yes, we also hear about individual instances of possible misconduct. But um, we have some very savvy community groups, legal accuracy groups and others in New York that, that know exactly what we do and have been waiting for an agency like this and have prepared and continue to pre prepare position papers, staking out their interest in what they, what they hope that we'll, we'll, we'll do. So absolutely, people, are, people come to us, a lot of people come to us because they know we handle systemic issues through our complaint intake function that I described earlier, there we'll get a lot of individual complaints. So do you hold community forums or town halls? Um, do you sponsor those in, 
in neighborhoods? We, we haven't sponsored a town hall. I mean, something we've, we are discussing doing. Uh, we have one outreach person, of course, um, but we have, that has not stopped us from, from getting out the word as best we can uh, on, in, in various forums and, and attending precinct you know, council meetings and, 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 and others. Uh, so yes, we, you know, that's something that we would certainly you know, consider for the future. Do you, do, you, do you look to um, certain geographical areas uh, to, to, to get the outreach or engagement uh, within the five boroughs? Yeah, that's part of the process, yes. Um, I mean, a lot of the outreach uh, has been driven um, by the projects that were in, the issues that we're identifying in the projects, but we have absolutely um, ha had engagements uh, with people throughout New York City. So how could the public better uh, engage with the PDIG in terms of uh, feedback, direction uh, on future investigations? H how could that relationship right. improve? So that's a good question. I mean, I'll tell you what we do, which very often when we issue a report, uh, we will uh, not wait for the public to engage with us. We'll issue a report, and then uh, we will uh, it's almost uh, the, the normal procedure where we will set up a, a, an in-person meeting or a conference call with a coalition of people who have previously you know, expressed concerns about a particular issue, and we will, we will talk to them about the report, get their feedback, get their criticisms, uh, get their ideas on next steps and so forth, and so we don't wait for them to come to us. That said, um, I, I think it is important um, uh, for, this, for this outreach uh, to continue uh, not only, you know, when we're putting together a report or uh, even outside of the context of the report, but really after we issue the report, that's when um, the outreach is all that m uh, more important. And so we are anxious perhaps, to, you know, to talk to uh, outreach specialists who work for some of you council members. If you have ideas about how we can better engage with people after we issue reports and at any point in time, we'd be very open to those suggestions and ideas. Has your outreach uh, ever resulted in a report? Yes, yes. absolutely. Ab yes, absolutely. That first summer, as I yeah. as I described, the, being on the listening tour, there are, a U visa came from that process. Um, so it was because of what you heard absolutely. in your outreach about the U visa that that you issued the report that you missed. Absolutely. I mean, there were some issues, I guess. I, had, I was new to New York City in 2014. I guess there were issues that were already on the agenda before I got here. But I met that, uh, that summer, 2014, with a group of Muslim Americans um, and others from civil rights and civil liberties organizations expressing concerns about surveillance practices. And we learned a lot from those discussions and further discussions. And so you could say, in a sense, our report grew out of that, even though that was a big enough issue that we were probably going to do it anyway. But the, the point is, is that we, we met with these groups, uh, and there are other examples uh, where we have, um, uh, there, there are examples in the pipeline that I can't talk about right now that came directly from the engagement with members of the public that you'll be hearing and reading about in the near future. So the plans on the horizon are for a wider outreach and uh, uh, public engagement? Absolutely. I see. That's the goal. Okay, great. Um, I see that we're pretty much uh, depleted here in terms of members, and uh, our chair, uh, Gibson, had to step out for a minute. But I think uh, that uh, pretty much completes uh, our questioning, uh, unless you had some final words that you'd like to, to add. No. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Great. Thank, thank you so much, both Commissioner, Inspector General Yuri. Thank you so much for being here. We appreciate your time. Thank you. We'll now go to uh, our second panel. And our second panel uh, will be um, Debbie Silverman from the uh, Brooklyn Defender Services. Uh, we'll give her five minutes. Time.
No, no. Okay, Ms. Silver, when, when you're ready, you can begin. Thank you. My name is Debbie Silverman, and I'm a senior trial attorney at Brooklyn Defender Services. I thank the Committee on Public Safety and Oversight and Investigations for holding this hearing and providing us with the opportunity to testify before you today. A number of recent high-profile corruption and misconduct scandals demonstrate continued systemic problems at NYPD. Recent bribery allegations against both senior leadership staff and the gun licensing division have rightly attracted a lot of media attention. Today I'll discuss additional issues that have not received as much attention and warrant scrutiny by NYPD, OIG, and the Council. These issues are racial disparities in law enforcement, police perjury, the problems of so-called gang raids, and finally police harassment and predatory enforcement outside methadone clinics and needle exchanges. And if time permits, questions by Council Members Williams and Lander regarding uh, NYPD's treatment of EDP as well as uh, your questions on what OIG can do in terms of involving the public are also issues I can address if the time permits. But first I'll address racial disparities in law enforcement. Uh, and I want, wanted to thank Council Member for Perkins for raising this issue about raise, uh, racial disparities that we continue to see. There are sharp racial disparities that continue to persist in NYPD enforcement practices. Arguably, the clearest evidence of this dynamic exists in marijuana possession arrests. Contrary to past media reports, low-level marijuana arrests have not ended. In fact, though arrest rates have declined since their peak under Mayor Bloomberg and NYPD Commissioner Kelly, they remain dramatically higher than they were during Mayor Giuliani's first term. Low-level marijuana possession remained the NYPD's top drug arrest in 2016 and fourth most common overall arrest. From 2014 through 2016, 86% of the 60,990 of those arrests were for low-level marijuana possession across New York City, were identified as black and or Latino, despite government surveys showing equal or greater marijuana use by white people. A report by the Drug Policy Alliance, DPA, found that the people of color were far more likely to be arrested for this offense, even in majority white neighborhoods. None of this information or data is surprising to me. In my nearly seven years as a public defender, I cannot recall ever representing a white person on a marijuana charge. Importantly, 64% of U.S. residents, including a majority of Republicans, support full legalization of marijuana consumption. No arrests, no prosecutions, no tickets, and no fines. BDS supports DPA's campaign to legalize and sensibly regulate marijuana in New York State. We do not believe any additional investigations or reports are needed to justify this long overdue reform. However, OIG NYPD could use marijuana arrests as a launch point to investigate racial disparities in NYPD enforcement practices generally as they are clearly present in arrests for fair evasion, sex work, and countless other offenses. The second issue I'd like to address is police perjury, or what we like to call test-a-lying. Police perjury, or test-a-lying, is prevalent in New York, and the NYPD has taken no recognizable actions to meaningful present police perjury. In fact, a respected federal district judge in Brooklyn, Judge Jack B. Weinstein, recently told the city to expect a court hearing regarding the prevalence of such lying. The case in which the judge issued this order involved a 59-year-old bodega cashier charged with drug dealing. He had been fully strip searched in addition to being arrested and detained. The district attorney asked for and the criminal court judge granted money bail, though fortunately the man was able to pay and fight his case at liberty. Ultimately, the case against him fell apart as surveillance video showed the arresting officer's account was false. In other words, the strip search, along with the other humiliations of criminalization, was apparently performative. I myself have ample ex experience fighting police who lie in court under oath. 
In 2014, I represented a man named Jeffrey Herring who was arrested for gun possession. Mr. Herring insisted the gun was planted by the police and his story never wavered. While investigating his case, I discovered that the arresting officers had troubling records of misconduct and false testimony relating to gun arrests. They adhered to a pattern involving an apparently fictitious informant, just as they had done in my case. I soon discovered several other cases in which the same arresting officers were involved in gun possession cases that they fell apart under scrutiny as well. We were able to get the case against my client, Mr. Herring, dismissed, and the Kings County District Attorney's Office announced an investigation into these officers. Yet even after the New York Times reported on the apparent trend of misconduct by these officers in my case, and the trail of dismissed cases that they left behind, the discredited officers remained on the force and continued to testify as witnesses for the prosecution, still apparently adhering to the same basic pattern of perjury and evidence tampering. A public defender with the Legal Aid Society working on a later case brought in what they had learned about the unreliability of these officers, which they had only learned through the New York Times. The Kings County District Attorney's investigation had apparently ended, and as far as I know, the officers remain on the force. Even more troubling, the new gun courts designed to pressure faster and harsher pleas with longer jail sentences for cases involving alleged gun possession are likely only exacerbating this phenomenon. Can we just sum up, uh, if you can, we have your testimony, so we can just summarize, that'd be great. Certainly. The third issue is in regard to policing communities through so-called gang rates. And what's most troubling about police communities through these so-called gang raids is how an NYPD is ultimately identifying whom they ultimately argue are members of these gangs. Uh, we have serious concerns about how these gang designations are marginalizing certain members of the community, and we have no information as to how these designations are being made. But these designations are being used to target very specific members of the community. As far as we know, there is no judicial review as to how these officers are characterizing individuals as members of gangs. And yet these characterizations by NYPD are being used against people in our community. For example, when an individual is arrested and brought before a judge and the prosecution asks for bail, it is very frequent for the prosecutor to allege that a member standing before a judge is a member of a so-called gang with no review whatsoever. And that information is being used against our clients, is being used to incarcerate individuals. Additionally, there are serious problems with regard to the identification of individuals as members of gangs as it relates to ICE. People are being arrested. We recently had several arrests by ICE because there were these so-called gang identifications. These individuals were charged with uh, misdemeanors of trespass and arrested under the pretense that they were involved in gangs. And finally, the last issue is arrests outside of methadone clinics and needle exchanges. And what we're seeing in regard to this is we're seeing practices by NYPD gathering outside these methadone clinics. Now, these clinics play a crucial and significant role in terms of getting help for the individuals who need it. Yet what we're seeing time and time again, and it's been a very systematic problem, of N members of NYPD parked outside these methadone clinics for the purpose of engaging in undercover buy-in busts and then ultimately arresting individuals outside these methadone clinics who are there to get help. It is no secret that we have a huge opioid crisis in this country. And it, it mandates and it certainly necessitates review of this NYPD systematic policy to target individuals in these methadone clinics. And we are asking the council and OIG to investigate this continued NYPD practice. Just addressing some of the concerns of the other council members, notably how NYPD is addressing individuals uh, identified as EDP. The best way, I would argue, to address what NYPD is doing is ask the public defender's offices who deal with EDPs on a daily basis. Uh, there are many times when we get paperwork from NYPD, and NYPD has not identified individuals as EDP, but hospital paperwork would certainly support otherwise. So in reviewing police practices, 
the best way is to ask, well, where are we getting sufficient and accurate data? And public defender's offices are a very significant organization that can provide accurate data outside of NYPD. So when OIG is investigating, are these practices being followed? There are organizations in every borough that can answer those questions of how many EDPs, how are those EDPs being treated, is anyone with training showing up? And I would argue that that is very similar to what uh, you had been inquiring about, Council Member, as to what OIG is doing to, it, what, what are they doing in the community insofar as looking at community concerns and what is the community asking questions about, is at public defender's offices we have the benefit of seeing systemic issues. Unfortunately, OIG is not in court. Well, let me ask you this then. Uh, have, have you or, or Brooklyn Defenders engaged in any dialogue with the OIG and YPD? I will defer to my colleague uh, as to answer. Just identify yourself for the record, please. Of course, my name is Jared Chauso and I'm a- hit, hit the button. Apologize. My name is Jared Chauso and I'm a senior uh, policy specialist at Brooklyn Defender Services. And we have had some preliminary conversations and we certainly look forward to um, future discussion. So have you shared some of these findings? Because these are very serious findings that, that you've that Ms. Silverman just testified about. Have you shared this with, uh, with the? Uh, we have not discussed uh, the matters of this testimony with, with the OIG. So uh, I assume you're planning to do so though, right? Yes. Okay. And, and uh, I, I, I assume you're going to request that some type of um, investigation be conducted by the IG's office. Yes, where appropriate. Right, okay. Here? Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Appreciate it. And we have, we have your full testimony. We'll put it as a part of the record also. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Chair. Our final uh, panel today is Mr. Tawaki Kamatsu. You may begin. Um, hi, um, I'm Tawaki Komatsu, I'm a U.S. Navy veteran. Um, I've speak, spoken to different members of the council before while testifying in other committees. Um, the reason why we're here today is this is a meeting about uh, the Inspector General. Um, with regards to oversight, I've filed complaints repeatedly against the actions, the conduct of me members of the Mayor's NYPD security detail. However, there's been absolutely no corrective action taken since uh, April 27th when I was unlawfully kept out of a public town hall meeting in violation of federal law and New York State's open meetings law. So the question is if this meeting today is about the systemic abuse um, by members of the NYPD, if I've been reporting that misconduct since uh, April and we're now into November, um, at what point will members of the council or I guess uh, the Inspector General's office take appropriate corrective action. One of the people that has been engaged in such misconduct is NYPD, NYPD Deputy Inspector Howard Redman, the Mayor's Head of Security, who is actually a defendant in a federal civil rights lawsuit across the street right now. And that lawsuit dates back two years. So I actually asked uh, the Commissioner of the NYPD at the New York City Bar Association, I think back in June, um, if Mr. Redman is a defendant in a federal civil rights lawsuit, why exactly is he the mayor's head of security? I mean, it's just common sense. If someone's defending a civil rights, civil, sorry, civil rights lawsuit, it makes absolutely no sense whatsoever for him to be the top bodyguard for the New York City mayor. When I brought that to Mr. O'Neill's attention, he told me that he wasn't aware of the lawsuit, so I immediately provided him a copy with it. And since then, there have been basically 16 additional public meetings from which I've been illegally excluded. So I guess the point is, if I'm a whistleblower, I've raised this uh, point previously to the legal director of the NYCLU as well as the ACLU at the Fordham Law School last month. Um, both of them conf confirmed I had a legal right to walk through the doors just like anybody else and attend those public meetings, which influence um, voters' decision about who they want to be the next mayor. I mean, part of campaigning is 
meeting with members of the public, uh, listening to what their concerns are, and addressing those concerns. I had a conversation with Governor Cuomo, actually, on Saturday during the Veterans Day Parade. He made remarks to the effect of, um, if there's a dis disagreement, disagreements are to be aired, they're to be discussed. Well, if the top political official in New York State made those questions, made that remark on Veterans Day, don't you think that members of the NYPD should heed his uh, direction as supposedly law enforcement officers, or are they just people wearing a costume and carrying a badge? Um, but yeah, I mean, I guess with regards to the federal criminal statute that these alleged law enforcement officers are violating, it's actually 18 U.S.C. 245. Mr. Uh, was it Gentile, you were a candidate for the Brooklyn DA's office, I believe. So I think I'm talking to an appropriate person here. If you're familiar with federal criminal statutes and members of the NYPD are violating those statutes, the question is, at what point will a district attorney or a candidate for district, district attorney uh, um, DA's office take appropriate corrective action? I broached that question to uh, Mr. Vance at the New York, uh, Bar New York City Bar Association. His response to me when he was sitting next to Lawrence Byrne of legal at the NYPD was he's not a federal prosecutor, therefore, um, despite the fact he took an oath upon becoming the DA, he wasn't going to enforce federal, crim federal, cr yeah, federal criminal statutes that apply to civil rights. So, yeah, I guess my question to uh, the people uh, sitting over there is what legal recourse can you offer? Okay, well, we appreciate you coming and spending the time and waiting to, to give your testimony. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, seeing no other witnesses, uh, we conclude uh, this hearing. And again, I thank my colleague, uh, Chair uh, okay. Vanessa Gibson, uh, and the Public Safety Committee. And I also want to acknowledge uh, my committee counsel, uh, Josh Kingsley, and my legislative director, uh, Jonathan Chapchehis, who has departed, I guess, at the moment. But I want to thank them for helping to put this really substantive uh, hearing together. With that, this hearing is closed. And the Committee on Public Safety vote of proposed intro 1267A, um, the vote is officially closed. Thank you.